curious centric language, as we have uh, seen, is um, elite male lang centered language. And uh, therefore, it limits our understanding. As I've already mentioned, uh, Brian Blunt has pointed to African American slaves of the antebellum period who possessed uh, the ability to listen for God's direction in and uh, for their lives in the Bible. What they sensed was the drumbeat of freedom. However, he also points out uh, that this African-American slave practice to listen for the drumbeat of freedom did not become the standardized practice of interpretation for the whole church. Rather, it were Euro-American scholars, ministers, and lay folk who, I quote him, have over the centuries used their economic, academic, religious, and political domin dominance to create as the illusion that the Bible read through their Euro-American experience is the Bible read correctly. And so methodologically, a uh, methodological study of the Bible became in essence an exercise in reading the Bible through Euro-American eyes. Feminist scholars in terms have pointed out, in turn have pointed out that throughout the centuries, scripture has been read and interpreted with an androcuriocentric, andro that is an elite male lens. Since women of all races, classes, and cultures have been excluded from authoritative biblical interpretation and from teaching throughout the centuries. This exclusion has been and still is done on biblical textual grounds. I just remind you of 1 Corinthians 14 or 1 Timothy 2. And don't ask me, you all know it, the subject, subject. Hence, the objective and goal of a critical feminist biblical interpretation is not just a better understanding of the Bible, Rather, its goal is the conscientization of biblical readers. Scripture, I have argued, can become such a liberating resource if we are able to engage scripture in a critical feminist uh, uh, fashion in such a way that in the words of Blunt, the whisper that the slaves heard takes flesh. I quote him, and what God says will be different according to the variable conditions in which the human spirit who encounters it finds itself. When this spiritual whisper becomes an in, in, incarnate word gripping human spirits where they live, it takes up the causes of the people who encounter it in the situation of that encounter. It is in this way that God's eternal voice for all becomes a living word exclusively for them. The whisper takes on flesh. Feminist biblical interpretation insists that we have to wrestle with the fact that the flesh which the living word takes on is expressed in androcuriocentric elite male-centered language that mentions women only if there is a problem, if they are exceptional, or if they are accidentally mentioned by an author uh, of the greetings in the New Testament. I say always be if you want to live in hist uh, historical records, always be attached to a great man. <laughs> Hence, women have to think twice, or sometimes three times, when we read androcuriocentric texts 
and ask, are we meant, when these texts speak of, for instance, of citizens, apostles, or clergymen? Since women from the beginning, uh, when we learn to speak, uh, have to learn how to think twice, I recommend this as a good spiritual exercise to learn how to think twice and ask, am I meant when she speaks of women, with a slash. In order to make such anthropocentric language use conscious, I use women as a generic term and write women with a slash, as I already <laughs> explained several times, um, to indicate that women includes men, she includes he, and female includes male. The rhetoric of our textual sources and their scholarly interpretations, however, is not just androcentric, that is male-centered, but it is curiocentric, that is elite male, lord-centered. Hence, androcuriocentric texts such as First Peter must be read against their uh, androcentric, curiocentric grain. Biblical texts, as they are read by individuals or heard in the liturgy of the church, perpetuate the elite male bias and exclusiveness of our own culture and language. Without question, biblical language is male-centered, but is it deliberately exclusive of women? For instance, First Peter does not use the Greek word ecclesia, which is usually translated as church, for its community of readers, but rather uh, the letter uses the Greek word adelphotes in 2.17 which means brotherhood. Does this mean that women were not members of the communities addressed by First Peter? Obviously not, since women are explicitly uh, uh, addressed in 3, 1 to 7, as we have already heard. Or to give another example, when students are asked where women are mentioned in First Peter, they instantly point to chapter three to the verse I just mentioned, but not to chapter two. Why? Does this mean that only male house slaves, uh, oiketes, belonged to the community and no women slaves because the word slave is masculine? This is also not very likely, but when we read letters, when we read uh, scripture, uh, we uh, do not read them as both male and female. Hence, the grammatically androcuriocentric text of First Peter must be read against the grain, since such androcuriocentric text eradicates the presence of women. When texts like uh, First Peter mention women, these references must be read like as a tip of an iceberg, indicating how much has been lost to historical remembrance and religious cultural consciousness. That it is important not to overlook the anthropocentric uh, <coughs> uh, character of the language of biblical text in general, and for of First Peter in particular. <clears throat> Androcuriocentric texts are parts of an overall puzzle and design that must be fitted together in creative, critical interpretation. It is crucial, therefore, that we challenge the blueprints of the uh, uh, design, assuming instead a feminist lens of reading, one that allows us to place women into the center of attention. Such a feminist critical uh, method uh, could be likened to the work of a detective insofar as it does not <coughs> rely <coughs> solely on historical facts nor invents its evidence, but is engaged in an imaginative reconstruction of cultural uh, religious life. 
or to use the metaphor provided by the poet Adrian Rich in order to wrest meaning from anthropocentric text and history, we have to mine, I quote her, the earth deposits of our history in order to bring, I quote, the ins uh, essential vein to light, to find the bottle amber perfect, the tonic for living on this earth, the winters of this climate, end of quote. Such a feminist uh, hermeneutical method in process for entering an old text such as First Peter from a new critical direction is not just a chapter in cultural, historical, religious reading, but an act of feminist transformation. Uh, such a transformation depends, however, on a critical reappropriation of classic uh, scriptural texts. To quote Elizabeth Fox Genovese, women looking to the most prestigious text of the Western tradition confront misogyny, idealization, objectification, silence. The absence of female consciousness from that tradition challenges a feminist interpretation to look beyond and through the text. The absence uh, anchors one term of a double meaning. The silences all the more difficult to restore because of the circuitous interpretations they call for, uh, offer clues to the willed suppression of women. But to translate silence into meaning requires a, crystal, a critical distance from the tradition, as well as an immersion in it." End of quote. The systemic anthropocentrism uh, of Western culture is evident in the fact that nobody questions whether men have been historical subjects and mediators of revelation. The role of women, always women with a slash, and not that of men becomes problematic because maleness is a norm while femaleness constitutes a deviation. Whenever we speak of men as a scientific and historical subject, we mean the male. For the Western understanding and uh, hegemonic expression of reality, elite hetero-male existence is the standard of human existence. In and through language, our societal and scientific structures define women as derivative and secondary to men. This anthropocentric definition of being human has determined and still does not only the scholarly perception of men, but also those of women. In such an androcentric worldview, women must remain historically marginal. The androcentric scholarly paradigm can uh, thematize the role of women as a societal, historical, philosophical, and theological problem, but it cannot question its own horizon which relegates the women question to the periphery of scholarly concerns. It relegates it as a trivial issue not worthy of serious attention. The historical theological marginality of women is therefore generated not only by the original biblical sources, but also in and through the anthropocentric interpretations of scholarship. So let us look at the text of First Peter. The New Testament writing called First Peter was written at the end of the first century uh, and is addressed to resident aliens who live in the Roman province of Asia Minor. They are portrayed as a marginalized group who experience harassment and suffering. This pseudonymous epistle is a rhetorical communication in the form of a circular letter. 
uh, between those who live in the uh, metropolitan center of imperial Rome, which is theologically camouflaged as Babylon, in those who live in Asia Minor as colonial subjects. And now it would be nice if we had a map to see how much, Ro how far Rome and Asia Minor were um, uh, separated. First Peter is not a writing concerned with inner church pol polemics or orthodox beliefs, but is a circular letter uh, and a, a rhetorical communication between those who live in the <coughs> metropolitan center of Imperial Rome, or I just, uh, as a communication from the metropolitan center, the circular letter is cast in what had become the traditional and authoritative Pauline letter form. It enlarges um, the traditional greeting by qualifying the sender as apostle of Jesus Christ and by characterizing the recipients not in communal democratic terms as ecclesia, but in political group terms as transients or migrants. According to the authors, the migrants have been elected through the uh, foreknowledge of God the Father, the uh, sanctification of the Spirit for obedience, and the sprinkling of the blood of Christ. Like the genuine Pauline letters, First Peter ends with a farewell address in 5.12 to 14 that summarizes the purpose of the letter uh, uh, as I quote, uh, quote, to encourage uh, the readers to testify to the true grace of God and to admonish them to stand fast in it. It mentions those who um, send greetings, the elect one in Babylon, my son Mark, and Silvanus, the transcriber or the deliverer of the letter. It ends with the admonition to greet each other with a kiss of love and wishes all of them peace. It's interesting that we have lost the kiss of love but kept the uh, wish of peace. It is debated whether a woman is meant with the title elect one in 513 um, 513 mentions as a co-elect one in Babylon, a feminine form which can be understood as referring to a communal uh, representation of the uh, community in Rome, uh, to the Roman church or the Roman church it itself, or it can refer to a well-known woman leader in Rome. Just as exegetes construe the expression elect lady and sister in 2 John uh, 1 and 13 as not referring to an individual woman, so also commentators of 1 Peter insist that the expression co-elect in Babylon does not refer to an actual well-known woman leader in Rome. Rather, they argue it is a reference to the Roman church or to a figurative representation of the church. It, uh, if exegetes read 513 as referring to an actual woman, they have tended to understand 513 as referring to Peter's wife. What a surprise. Judith Applegate has uh, carefully scrutinized the pro and con arguments for understanding 1 Peter 5.13 as referring to a woman leader in Rome. She points out that scholars claim it is natural not to think of, particular woman, of a particular woman leader or the uh, three and five out of five letter greetings to and from churches refer to an actual woman in 1 Corinthians 16, uh, Colossians, and Romans. Moreover, the expression elect is never used in conjunction with the word ecclesia, but is used only with reference to individuals. 
Hence, we can conclude, she argues, that uh, the recipients must have known the woman leader who was mentioned among them, among those who uh, sent greetings. If this is the case, then First Peter appeals to the authority of a well-known woman leader. However, we also have to see that this means that a well-known woman leader uh, justifies the message of subordination in the letter. So it's a double-edged sword. Moreover, it is not clear whether women are included among the addressees, since the letter uses masculine, generic, or gender-specific terms, both grammatically and in terms of content, to characterize the recipients. If curiously, Lord uh, Master, Slave Master, uh, centered language is used here in the generic sense, inclusive sense, then one can assume that women in general, and slave women in particular, were included among those addressed. The reference to well-to-do wives in 3, 1 to 6 supports a, such a grammatically gen, uh, generic reading because it indicates that the ladies were definitely part of the community. However, uh, one could also argue for a gender-specific masculine understanding, insofar as the behavior of slaves and wives is mentioned as a special case. The rest of the letter could be addressed to freeborn male citizens only, depending on how one understands the community's self-understanding of quotation mark brotherhood. A different honor code determines the brotherhood community insofar as it, is, it distinguishes honorable behavior toward everyone and toward the emperor from brotherly love, which is required in the brotherhood. However, the dominant curiocentric elite male ethos seems to prevail insofar as the community is called brotherhood also, we know that uh, women were members of the community. The designation of the community as brotherhood could be either a conventional reference borrowed from the nomenclature of social collegia and religious association, or it could imply a masculine theological self-understanding, or it could refer to the community either as a patriarchal family or as an egalitarian siblinghood. If the recipients understood their community as Adelfotes in the generic sense, as siblinghood of sisters and brothers who are equally called holy and elect, rather than as curiatal male-only family, then one can grasp that it is the author who seeks to reshape the self-understanding of the community in Asia Minor in terms of the patriarchal household or familia. The author characterizes and constructs the rhetorical situation in terms of three stra strategies that are uh, va valorized differently by a different um, uh, e uh, exegetes. First, the strategy of suffering. Second, the strategy of election and honor. And third, the strategy of subordination. These rhetorical strategies are not discrete parallel areas, but work together dialectically to construct the rhetorical situation to which the letter can be understood as a fitting response. Main differences in the interpretation of the letter and its function result from the fact that exegetes tend to centralize one strategy and privilege it over the others. First, then, the situation of suffering. Scholars almost universally agree that the problem confronted by the rhetoric of First Peter is that of suffering. In addition, virtually all recent interpreters agree that First Peter does not refer 
to an empire-wide persecution of Christians, but rather describes the situation of the recipients as harassment and social ostracism and slander on a, uh, a local level. There is also agreement that the recipients are threatened with suffering because uh, they are Christians, followers of the Messiah, Jesus. A close reading of the letter can show that the opening and the conclusion of the letter refers in an almost formulaic way to the suffering of Christ and the Christians. For instance, in 110, uh, for instance, 110 refers to the sufferings and subsequent glory of Christ. 5.1 calls Peter a witness to the suffering of Christ Messiah. 1.6 stresses that the recipients can rejoice in their imperishable eschatological inheritance, even if now, for a little while, they have had to suffer various trials. Thus, one can... Uh, uh, isolate three characters of suffering that refers to the Messiah's Christ's suffering as paradigmatic for the recipients. In 2, 18 to 25, the house slaves who suffer unjustly are referred to Christ's example of suffering, but not to his ministry and message. The section in 3, 13 to 22 begins with a rhetorical question. Who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? It tells the recipients not to be intimidated, but to keep a good conscience so that those who abuse you for your good, uh, for your good conduct as Christian, your good conduct as Christians may be put to shame and then in verse 18 to 22 speaks of Christ's suffering, resurrection, vindication, and exaltation. Furthermore, 412 to 19 refers to the fiery ordeal and tells the audience to rejoice because they will be blessed when Christ's Messiah's glory is revealed. Uh, if they now share in his suffering, if they suffer in the name of Christ, the Spirit of God is upon them. To suffer as a Christian or messianic, a Messiah follower should not be <coughs> considered a disgrace. The section ends with a statement that the judgment of God begins with the household of God. Ask what will become of those who are ungodly and sinners and concludes, I quote, Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust themselves to a faithful creator by continuing to do good. Second, uh, the strategy of election and honor. The author rhetoric of honor, praise and glory on the one hand and of slander, shame and disgrace on the other has engendered several books and numerous articles that offer readings of First Peter in terms of the anthropological honor and shame rhetoric of the Mediterranean culture. For instance, Bart Campbell has analyzed uh, the rhetoric of honor and shame and its function in the overall rhetoric of the letter. According to him, this rhetoric of honor and shame is summed up in 2.12. Conduct yourself honorably among the Gentiles, so that through the, uh, so they may malign you as evildoers, they may see you honor your honorable deeds and glorify God when he comes to judge. While Eliot previously reconstructed the meaning of the letter in terms of sectarian cohesiveness, more recently he has also read the gospel according to Peter in the key of honor and shame. According to this ancient, uh, to this anthropological theory, ancient Mediterranean culture was structured by the binary dualism of honor and shame. Such a uh, 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 grid of interpretation, however, is conceptualized in curiocentric terms 
whereby maleness is associated with honor and femaleness with shame. Uh, moreover, this dualistic theory of cultural anthropology is intertwined with antiquarian historical studies, insistence that uh, the past is totally different from the present. In biblical studies, uh, <clears throat> appropriation of this cultural theory of honor and shame uh, comes to uh, represent the present in contemporary American culture, which is understood in the singular. Furthermore, the Mediterranean, or as they say, the Mediterranean culture is completely different from American culture, probably also from Mexican culture, but I, I don't address mixing culture. Furthermore, the Mediterranean uh, cultures of antiquity are said to have been group cultures in which males embody the honor of the group while females embody the family of family's shame. So here you see already how you have an androcentric um, theory shaping the interpretation of the letter. If you don't accept the theory of Mediterranean culture, you will not accept the thing. Stephen Beck, uh, Beck has focused on suffering community and Christology in First Peter in terms of the honor-shame culture in which the letter was written and concludes that the problem of suffering First Peter is a threat to the honor of the community. According to him, the addresses of, uh, addressees of First Peter were attacked, verbally abused, and accused of wrongdoing because of their conversion. Such attacks and harassment constituted a threat to their honor and posed uh, a serious problem for their self-identity in a society in which one place, uh, <clears throat> one's place was determined by one's socially conferred honor, end of, end of quote. Hence, the letter seeks to provide a legitimization of their symbolic universe that is able to satisfactorily address the problem of their suffering and social change. However, he overlooks that such suffering is only applied to uh, elite gentlemen, because that is where the culture is uh, attacked. The rhetoric of subordination, uh, second, uh, uh, then the rhetoric of subordination, no, the, the rhetoric of subordination or being subjects. Um, the injunction into subordination is used five times in First Peter. Four times it addresses a group of people, everyone in 2.13, household slaves in 2.18, wives in 3.1, and younger people or neophytes in 5.1. Only once it is used in a descriptive praise stat statement in 3.22, which states that angels, authorities, and powers were made subject to Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God. This last statement makes it clear that a hypotassane to subordinate expresses a relation of ruling and power. Apocalyptic and cosmic language mythologizes the curiarchal order of the empire. Jesus Christ, Christ uh, has become Lord, curious, we talked yesterday about it, uh, and he is at the right hand of God, the Almighty. Whereas church ministry is later understood in analogy to Christ's power of ruling, First Peter admonishes the elders of the community not to lord it, katakuriontes, uh, not to lord it over those in their charge. In a classical rhetorical analysis, the sections 211 to 312 emerges as the core of the letter become a colon in its title, become colonial subjects or subalterns. Since the subaltern behavior of household slaves and wives towards the imperial authorities is a topos or theme of the central argumentation, scholars note that the authors first combines and advocates here 
the imperial eaters spelled out in the discourses about politics and the political order and about the household. Then the author funds it with reference to the example of the suffering of Christ and the matriarch Sarah. And finally, um, <coughs> moralizes such colonial submission as righteousness and as doing good. The whole section is introduced with an appeal to honorable conduct addressed to the non-citizens and transients who are hailed as beloved. At this point, it becomes obvious that the senders till uh, the sender theologizes and moralizes the dominant curiarchal ethos of Roman imperialism and requests that the subordinates realize and live in their live it in their practices of subordination. The rationale and motivation gives its uh, missionary it given its missionary they should conduct themselves honorably so that the Gentiles glorify God on the day of visitation. The co a command to abstain from human desires endangered their lives, is that endangered their lives is elaborated and elucidated in verse 3, uh, 13, uh, in verse 13 to 17, with admonition to subject themselves to the emperor as the supreme one and to the governors who are sent by him. That is, to the imperial administration, so that these figures of authority recognize them as doing what is right, honorable, or good. The theological justification given here is that such submission, understood as doing the honorable, is the will of God. Hence, the elite masculine ethos of honorableness has become Christianized. The injunction to the house slaves is in turn not st stated in an imperative but in a circumstantial uh, grammatical form, also used in 3, uh, 3 7 to 9. In a similar fashion, freeborn women are told to subject themselves to their husbands even to those who are not believers. The goal here is the conversion of the husbands that will be brought uh, uh, about not by their preaching to them, but by their proper ladylike conduct of purity and subordination and exemplified by the <coughs> matriarch Sarah. In some First Peter's Roman colonial rhetoric of subjection advocates the submission of the subaltern migrants and non-citizens in Asia Minor and specifies as a problem cases the unjust suffering of household slaves, women, and the marriage relationship between Christian women and Gentile husbands. Contemporary exegetes are generally uh, embarrassed by this rhetoric of subjection which feminist biblical scholars have indicted. Hence, uh, they seek to eliminate or mitigate the problem of modern hearers uh, reader or readers by translating uh, subordinate with accept the authority, defer to, show respect for, recognize the proper social order, or participate in, be involved in be committed to. You can see how different uh, expressions are used to mitigate uh, the meaning of the text. As theological subjects, I argue, we must insist on our spiritual authority to assess both the oppressive as well as the liberating imagination of uh, such biblical texts like First Peter. We also do, uh, need, do so because of the curiarchal functions of authoritative scriptural claims de that demand obedience and acceptance. And here I now refer to a, a typical uh, Catholic uh, uh, hermeneutical rule. What is revealed for the sake of our, that is women's salvation, liberation and well-being, cannot be articulated once and for all. 
the criterion of women's salvation and well-being. <laughs> there do we get some music. <laughs> uh, is a formal criterion that needs to be spelled out in ever new socio-political religious situations of struggle. It does not inhere in the biblical text, nor in the individual subjectivity of women readers, but must be articulated again and again within particular historical context of struggle against curiatal violence and exploitation. Thank you. Any questions or reflections, or are we out of time? No, we have some.